Oh, we're early. Anyway, two minutes early. It's unfair. All right. Hey. Good, uh, good afternoon, Bon. October 13th, right? I never remember. October 13th, right? Okay, good. <laughs> just told her we're going to do the whole thing in, in Japanese. So. That's okay with everybody, right? Of course. Yeah, so Zen,と何ですか?どうしてザーゼンをする?ああ、<laughs> uh, I just said, what is Zen and why do we do zazen? Uh, about half an hour ago, just well, maybe well, just before lunch, uh, I had this great idea. I just thought, I thought, oh, there! I have this great idea. What I'm going to talk about for this talk, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> so I, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. I had this great idea. It seemed so great. But I forgot it, so it's okay. Uh, the thing I've been talking about in a lot of... I give talks in different areas. so And sometimes uh, bookstores, sometimes interviews for uh, radio or newspapers and things. Um, so the audiences I talk to are have different kind of experience with Zen. Uh, most of the audiences I talk to have no experience of Zen. So I'm very accustomed to talking about Zen to people who have no experience of it. And when you talk about it to people who have no experience about it, you explain it one way. But when I'm talking to a group like this who have a lot of experience with Zen, I need to say a different thing. I've been doing zazen practice for, it's scary to say how long, <laughs> sometimes, because uh, I've been doing zazen practice for almost 30 years now, I think. And I was not even 30 years old when I started, so imagining uh, at that time, for me to imagine doing it for 30 years, it would have been impossible. I wouldn't... It, wouldn't have made any sense. Uh, so, actually, I've been doing zazen for most of my life. It's weird to say that. Um, and yet, sometimes I wonder why. Um, why do I do this, and why, why do I continue? When I started doing zazen, I think I had a clear idea about why. Um, I thought, this life is very mysterious. I want to know what it is. Uh, I want to know why I'm alive, why I'm here, what is the great meaning, or if there's no meaning, I want to at least confirm that there is no meaning. Um, somehow. And this practice seemed like a, a way to do that. When you read the ancient Buddhist sutras and things, they're full of uh, strange phrases. 
that seem to make no sense at first. Uh, the, the one I remember hearing was, uh, the first one I remember hearing was form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So that's form is le, oh shit, le, <laughs> le, oh Jesus, now I forgot. Leerheit, <laughs> damn it, I almost could do it. Form is Leerheit, Leerheit is form. Shiki sokuze ku ku sokuze shiki, which is what we translated, uh, what we chanted uh, this morning as part of the Heart Sutra. Uh, and um, I wanted to know what things like that meant. What is, wh- why, why did this ancient uh, Zen person say, form is emptiness, emptiness is form? Maybe, maybe he understood something that I can't understand. Um, maybe if I work at it, maybe I can understand what this means. Dogen also said, form is form, emptiness is emptiness. Uh, when he made his comment on the Heart Sutra. Uh, so, I think uh, form is form, leerheit is leerheit. Uh, was also his, his other explanation of form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Um, there seemed to be some kind of logic to these strange sayings, and they didn't seem to just be uh, random. They didn't seem to be just something somebody said, just to be weird. Um, I didn't, uh, I wasn't interested in things like reincarnation. I, I wouldn't say that. I was interested in things like reincarnation and life after death and things like that. But I couldn't believe in them. I suppose. And whenever I heard somebody give me a religious philosophy which depended for its existence on life after death or reincarnation or Moses parting the Red Sea or, I don't know, Jesus rising from the dead... Uh, I I couldn't believe any of this. Or, even if I could believe in it, it seemed to be irrelevant. The way Christianity was originally, the way it it was explained to me when I was younger was was, uh, that it all depends on um, this guy Jesus doing magical things. So you were supposed to believe that Jesus could do... uh, Miracles, and because Jesus could do miracles, therefore, what he said must be right. Therefore, we should follow it. But you know, I, I, I always thought, even if Jesus could do miracles, that doesn't prove that what he said <laughs> was right. It just proves he could do miracles. And besides that, the evidence is pretty poor. We don't even know who killed John F. Kennedy, you know, and that was, and that was barely fifty years ago. Uh, how, how do we? How can we uh, believe something that happened to uh, you know two thousand years ago? But this this Zen philosophy seemed like it was talking about something real, uh, but I didn't understand it. So, but I could understand the practice. Uh, there was zazen. My teacher taught me how to do zazen, like we've all been doing today. Just sitting silently. And at first it seems like a very strange way to try to figure out the meaning of life. <laughs> Sit and look at the wall. Like the meaning of life is going to appear on the wall. And it's going to scroll down. 
then you have to scroll past a bunch of advertisements and then you get the meaning of life. Okay, there we go. I think that's what people expect the meaning of life to be. Um, but the meaning of life is, is within life. I, uh, I bought a book in Berlin, in Kreuzberg, in a science fiction bookstore. And I was looking at the back of it, and it, it, one, one of the things it said in the back of the book is uh, mentioning some future where they make a drug that gives people a, a, a what was it? A, an experience of the fourth state, which is described as adulthood beyond adulthood. I thought it's interesting because a lot of uh, science fiction writers, they don't have an experience of uh, meditation practice. And a lot of people I meet don't have an experience. So they imagine that maybe uh, some drug can bring us to this kind of exalted state. But it's like saying you could give a drug to a a 10-year-old child to make her an adult. It it doesn't work. (laughs) You give the drug to the 10-year-old child, then wait 10 more years, then then you have an adult. (laughs) Then you say, look, the drug worked. (laughs) Um, And it's like that with Zazen. it's, it's, um, It's something that takes time. One has to spend... A lot of a lot of time on the practice. Uh, it's a kind of habit, in a way. My my teacher used to say, um, "Habit." What did he say? Something like habit is the the strongest thing. Um, so, we sit in Zazen and we watch ourselves. We watch our minds. And our minds, our brains are constantly uh, taking our experiences and uh, digesting them. Like your stomach digests your food, like the Tibetan food we just ate. I ate too much, too much of the fried bread. <laughs> Don't eat the fried bread. Oh, the fried bread is really good, though. Uh, anyway, no more fried bread for me. Uh, so, so I put that fried bread in my stomach, and now my stomach has to do something with it, you know? Turn it into either energy or poop, right? <laughs> two, two possibilities, or fat. Probably more likely fat. And it goes, oh, look, more fat. Ah. Uh. Um, and our brains do the same thing with our experience. We're, we're just tr- we're, we're experiencing, experiencing, and experiencing, and the brain has to um, categorize and um, understand the experience. Sometimes verbally, uh, sometimes non-verbally, just has to understand it, and. I started to think this meditation practice may be... A lot of people are excited about meditation and think it might be a good sort of option. You know, that might be something we could do, that might be something we can add to our lives. I think meditation is actually necessary. I think, I think we need it. I think for, for proper digestion we need it. For example, everybody knows that if you if you eat a big meal like we just ate, you don't immediately go running or swimming or you know weightlifting or you you wait you know an hour or something before before going out. But we don't do that with experience. Uh, we take one experience, we take another, we take another, we take another, take another, take another, take another just keep going, and there's no time. Uh, to digest it, we we sleep, and that and that's that's part of it, uh, and that helps. 
Uh, I think I think that's one reason we have to sleep. You know, you just overwhelm the body and mind with too much things, and you have to sleep and just, you know, stop for for a while. Uh, meditation is is like that too. Uh, you, but you 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 do it while not sleeping, which I think is also an important part. So you're you're awake, but you don't take any more experience. There's no internet during meditation, no, no television, no, you know, you're not reading, you're not listening to music. A lot of people ask me that question, like, can I listen to music while doing zazen? <laughs> and I say, well, you know, there's no law against it, but it's not zazen if, you, if you're listening to music. It's, it's listening to music. It's, it's something else. So the, the whole point of doing zazen is to not you're not introducing new information or experience. You're just uh, sitting with the experience and information which is already there, and just sitting with it. And because of that, the, there's no there's no goal to it. This is this is one of the most important parts of Zen practice and the, the part of Zen practice that I think is most poorly understood even by people who practice, which is there is no goal to the practice. Um, and it's, it's really, really hard, I think, to, to accept that because, because we, we have a goal for everything. We have a reason for everything. Of course, when you start doing Zen practice, y- you have a reason for it. Um, I did, like I told you at the beginning, I wanted to find out the meaning of life. You know, it's a pretty big reason, right? People have been trying for thousands of years to find the meaning of life. So, uh, what makes me think I'm going to be the one who does it, <laughs> right? Why, why would this idiot figure it out and nobody else could? So you have a reason. Maybe, maybe that's not your reason. Maybe you want to become calmer or, or more centered, more balanced, more, more happy. Uh, lots of reasons. So everybody has a reason. But in order for Zen practice to work, you have to throw away your reason and simply do the practice. And, and that means that when you're actually in the middle of practice, it doesn't do so much good to judge your practice, to say, oh, this, is, this isn't very good Zen practice, or, or the other one is, this is really good Zen practice, you know. Uh, neither one of those is very good. I, 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 I was at a Zen, uh, not a Zen temple, it was a, one of those against the stream places. They must, do they have one in Bonn? Against the stream? Doesn't have one yet? I like those guys, the, uh, Noah Levine and, and their group. Um, but some other teacher, when he visited the group, left behind a bunch of free uh, books. These weren't related to Noah, Noah Levine and Against the Stream. They were just free books left by some teacher. And uh, they had them on a shelf. And I picked one up and opened to a random page. And it says, after meditation, get up and ask yourself, how was your meditation? Was it, was it good? Was it bad? And I thought, oh, that's so different. <laughs> that's like, it's like that. that would be the opposite of the advice I would give as a Zen teacher. Uh, don't, don't worry about whether you're meditating. If you get up from your meditation, just forget it. It doesn't matter. You're done. Um, you give yourself a certain amount of time, you know, whatever it is, 40 minutes or 30 minutes or 20 minutes or 10 minutes or 5 minutes, whatever you do, uh, and you do the practice, and sometimes it feels wonderful, and sometimes it doesn't feel wonderful, and sometimes it feels like you got the answer, and then five minutes later you don't know what the answer was. Um, sometimes it just feels like, uh, why did I even do this? <laughs> you know, I just did this. Um, but it doesn't matter. The reason it's important that there's no goal is because in real life there is no goal. Uh, in this moment, 
there's no, there's no goal. There's nothing. Nothing is going to... Um, if you compare this moment to two years ago or two hours ago or whatever it was, you can say, oh, there was progress, you know, and I reached my goal. My goal was to speak in Bonn, Germany. And finally, I reached my goal. Um, you know, maybe, maybe all my life I just dreamed, you know, of it. You know, at first, well, it was the capital of West Germany. Well, now it's not the capital of West Germany, but I'm still dreaming of speaking there because that's what I want to do. But in this moment, it's, it's just whatever it is, you know. And, and that's the important part. We're, we're trying to allow this moment to be exactly as it is without trying to make it something else. Uh, now, of course, if you're in a, a bad situation, it's, it's useful to, to try to change that situation. Uh, you know, you're, you're, I don't know, you're in a, a marriage where your husband beats you all the time or something like that, that you know, some terrible situation like that. You, you would... Uh, you, you would want to change that. But you can only change it by uh, understanding the situation as it is and by <clears throat> being very much present with it and being alive within that situation. So, but, but when you're sitting, that you feel like you, you have a goal. And, and um, I can remember one particular sitting I did, a session, a seven-day session in which I uh, suddenly went, oh, there's no goal to this. <laughs> and it was a bit shocking, because I'd been doing zazen practice for years, for, for decades by then, thinking I understood there was no goal to it. But I, I, I thought there was no goal to it in... I kept shortening the time. You know, Okay, there's no goal to zazen practice over 20 years. So I go, okay, maybe there's a goal to practice for 10 years, you know? or five years, or one year, or half an hour, or one minute. And then I finally kind of broke all that down to this moment. In this moment, there's no goal. There can't be. There can't be. Uh, because there's no time for a goal to happen. Um, yeah. So... Why do I keep doing it? <laughs> um, my friend Greg said, uh, he, he's, the, he's a director of practice, is what they call it, at Tassajara, which is a Zen monastery in California. He said, the longer I do zazen, the harder it is to answer that question, why do you do zazen? <laughs> and I, I think it's true. It's, been, it's true for me, too. Uh, the more I do it, the, the more difficult it becomes to answer the question, why? And people, when they interview you, or I uh, get a lot of interviews from newspapers and, and, and magazines and, and, and radio shows and things, and when, wh when people approach someone they think is a religious teacher, which I don't think I'm a religious teacher, but people think you must be if you're a Zen teacher, uh, they, they're, they're accustomed to religious teachers trying to tell people, trying to sell them their religion. Right? So they want, they want to hear your, your sales pitch, your advertisement for your religion. But I, I don't have one. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't feel like there is one. You, ju you, just, um, you just do it. Uh, At the same time, it's, it's been important, and, and there have been things I've learned from this, this practice. Uh, I started to understand uh, that whole form is Lehrheit. Did I get it right? Yeah. Lehrheit is form. Uh, started to make sense to me after a while 
but it wasn't the kind of sense of an explanation sort of sense. This is going to drive me crazy all morning. Uh, it was um, it was sort of an experiential sense to to the uh, to the practice that there was that that emptiness which is our experience of the world which is hard to define and hard to explain and hard to express to others uh, and the material world in which we find ourselves existing the world of form are actually the same thing uh, they're not two two divided things <laughs> I think I just remembered what, what the idea I had to talk about was <laughs> at the beginning um, but I won't talk about that. You know, well, no, what it was, was I was thinking about um, animals, right? We, we human beings are, are a type of animal. That's what, that's what science tells us, right? Even though religion sometimes tells us we're not, I think science is probably more correct. We're a type of animal, but we're a type of animal who can do this amazing thing, which is we can communicate to each other in very great detail. And because, you know, I, 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 I've lived with cats before, and cats can communicate to each other, but they can't communicate much. Uh, but here we are as human beings, and everything we do is kind of communicating. You know, I'm talking to you, and though I'm speaking English, I'm communicating, I hope. Um, I, I, uh, I'm a musician, so I play music, and that communicates in a different way. Uh, the clothes I'm wearing, if I was a cat or an orangutan or a chimpanzee, I can only appear one way. You know, I, I, even, if, even if somebody puts clothes <laughs> on me, I don't know what they mean. Uh, other chimpanzees don't know what they mean. But human beings do. So I wear this. You know, I have this shirt. This is Akron, which is the town I grew up in, mostly. Um, you know, and I, I, have, I have this funny thing I found in a, a thrift store, this funny shirt with the weird dots all over it, which tells you something about the kind of person I am. I have a, you know, this haircut that I... I got this 80s haircut a few, um, a few weeks ago, and I sort of regret it, but it was, seemed like a, a fun idea at the time. <laughs> when I when I did it, uh, a friend of mine cut my hair. He's, he's good at cutting hair, and I said, "Give me like total, you know, 1985 mullet style." It seemed like a, it seemed like it would be funny. It was funny for a couple of weeks. Now I'm thinking maybe maybe I should cut it again. But it tells you it tells you something like who is this guy who has this 80s haircut, you know, um, and my glasses. So we we communicate with each other, right? All the time, and, and, and wherever we go is communicating. The, 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 this church, you know, tells us something. I'm not sure exactly what it tells us. Um, you know, and we have these minds. Like, I know there must have been a picture or something up there, um, but now it's gone. And there was probably something else over there that's gone now, because you can see on the wall the kind of mark it left behind. Oh, that's the heating. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, that makes sense. Because there's no... Huh? <laughs> that's why we're freezing cold. <coughs> um, but, you know, you, so, so you, have, you have all this information coming to you. And, and I think that's, that's kind of our problem. It's, it's, number one, it's what makes us kind of great and amazing as, as animals. Because we can we can, that whole thing about form is emptiness, the emptiness side, that experience side, is something that other animals can't really tell each other very much about. You know, a chimpanzee can't really tell another chimpanzee in great detail about uh, her experience, unless it's, you know, in one of those Planet of the Apes movies. Um, nobody laughs. Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> But, but, but Planet of the Apes aside, we can't, we, you know, they, they can't tell. But we can tell each other. So because of that, we're full of information, just full of information 
uh, from other people and from ourselves and from the world around us. Uh, and um, it's, it's, it's so much uh, that we need to stop. Uh, and and that, I, I think that's why we developed this, this practice. In Soto Zen, we stare at a wall. You know, deliberately, we try to find something that's not interesting and look at it <laughs> for a long time. Uh, and and it, seems, it seems, you know, that's why everybody's laughing. It seems ridiculous. But, but uh, what we're doing is... is it, we're not really looking at the wall. We're just, we're just putting our gaze somewhere and, and taking away all of the, as much as possible, all of the information that we have and simply trying to, to sit and allow all of it to, to digest and to, and to do what it wants to do, to do what it needs to do. How long am I supposed to talk? 245 or yeah. does anyone have any comments or anything we have 15 minutes um, perhaps somebody has something more interesting to say <laughs> than me because that's certainly possible what's that sound every sound is amplified in here No questions? No comments? Okay. Yes? You said something before uh, about time. Time. And, uh, uh, now the girl taking a drug and then you wait ten years and oh, yeah. she's an adult. What I'm always thinking about is do we learn by Zazen or do we learn by experience in time? Both, I think. Uh, I wonder that too, you know, people, I say, well, I've changed since I've done my Zazen practice. And they say, well, you've also gotten older too, so, you know, of course you, you, you change. Uh, but I, I think it's a bit of both, because if you, if you don't allow yourself the t- time to digest the experience, then, you know, you're always putting more into the system and, and it, it becomes very difficult to, to learn. Um, also, I know that whenever I stop doing zazen, I notice, I notice it. Uh, I notice that there's something missing. Uh, it happens when I travel a lot because um, when I do these tours, even though it's kind of ironic, I do these tours uh, around you know, the world now talking about Zazen, but when I'm on tour, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to do it because I'm just, you know, moving to, you know, moving from place to place. And then I start to notice, oh, I missed that. So I think, I think we, we learn from it. Um, we learn things that we can't learn any other way. Uh, we learn, for example, that even when your mind is telling you, go, 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 <laughs> you can just sit still with that. And I, I think when I, when I observe other people who are my own age who didn't do zazen practice, I can see that they, they're still um, listening to that voice that tells them to go and go and go and go and do, do something. Um, so so I, I think it's both. Someone's sweeping. Kumbaya. We should sing in here. We can really <laughs> sing because it's got good acoustics. Maybe a bit too echoey. Is there anything about practice that's mysterious to anyone? About Zen? Everything's mysterious about Zen. 
It's all mysterious. None of it makes any sense. Uh, my my uh, first teacher is a guy named Tim McCarthy, and he he's um, he was writing for his uh, PhD, you know, uh, PhD. Doctor of philosophy. Doctor of philosophy, yeah, yeah, degree. Um, and uh, he decided he's going to write a poem about Zen because no one understands Zen and no one understands poetry. So, obviously, it would seem brilliant. <laughs> but I mean, Zen is one of those words people say, yes. is emptiness yeah um, there's there's several ways to understand it I'll give you my way to un- my way of understanding it which is this we have um, we all have an ex- experience of this world which is very intimate to ourselves which which seems to be our own internal experience of things but we can't express that we can we can kind of talk around it you know i can say it's cold in this room uh but and and all, since all of you are here in this room we we understand exactly how cold and everything but if i if i'm on the telephone to somebody in in uh, california and i say it's cold here in bonn they they have to imagine you know what it's like. They, and, and because we, we are able to communicate, we can imagine pretty well. But, there's the, but the real experience of cold is, is kind of empty. It's kind of, a, it's kind of just the experience. It's not, it doesn't refer to the, to the word. So it's that, that's the, empty, the emptiness side of it. And then, and then there's the form side of it, which seems to be completely different. It's this, you know, this brick on this wall, or wall, floor, is, uh, is some kind of form. You know, it's, I can touch it, my hand doesn't go through it. Uh, it's form. Um, Buddhist philosophy is that there is no, there's no difference between uh, these two things. So, in, in reality, there, there are two ways of experiencing the same thing. So, the emptiness side, which feels the brick, is is ultimately the same as the form side, which is the brick. Um, which doesn't mean that we create everything with our minds. Uh, it, 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 you know, I got into a little... Um, I got into an argument with Deepak Chopra on Twitter. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I, I, saw, I, I, I subscribed to Deepak Chopra's Twitter thing, feed, whatever you call it. And uh, just because I thought it was silly most of the time and he said something about the world is the world is the creation of our minds and i said well no the also the mind is the is the creation of our mind is the creation of the world and we went back and forth with this it's in my it's in the book that i just published um uh, there is no god and he's always with you um because because he he comes from a school of philosophy that that believes that 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 um that matter is the creation of, of mind. But, uh, but Buddhist philosophy is different. It doesn't think matter is the creation of mind, but it doesn't think mind is, is, is created by matter either. Uh, it says that there is, there is one unified thing which isn't matter and which isn't mind. Uh, so, so it's quite a different philosophy from saying that, that you know, we're just dreaming all of this or something like that. Uh, the, 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 the thing itself is, is the dream. Oh boy, that sounds really weird. Um, so, I think, I think as human beings we have, we have these big brains, right? And we can communicate a lot with these brains and we can, we can imagine a lot. And I believe... I don't have evidence to prove this, but I think this is a good theory. 
that probably early in our history as human beings, it became very, very important to make to, to draw a big black line uh, with a, the thickest pen we could possibly find uh, between um, matter, you know, material reality, and this sort of experiential, you know, reality that that we can manipulate with our minds, you know. Uh, because people who were not able to do that would would die. Uh, you know, there's there's a big difference between a real Tyrannosaurus coming to eat you and an imaginary Tyrannosaurus <laughs> coming to eat you. And I know Tyrannosauruses didn't exist at the same time as humans, but anyway, <laughs> I think it's funnier that way. Um, so so our ancestors who could make a clear distinction between their internal experience and their external world were the ones who survived and left ancestors and created a society of human beings who, who make that very clear distinction. Uh, and um, I, think that's imp- I think it's an important distinction. But at the same time, all of these distinctions ultimately break down and there, there's a point at which, at which there is no there's no real difference between between the two, um, and and the 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 second question I would ask myself after that question is why is this important? Because who cares, right? Uh, but I think I think for me it's been really useful to to understand that because it makes everything seem much lighter than it was. I, I had believed that life was a very heavy thing, you know, it was very serious, uh, kind of grim or depressing. Um, but because, because I thought that I was separate from it, you know, I thought that there was life and there was me and that, and that I would never meet life. Uh, but what I found through doing the practice for a long time was that there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no distinction. There's no me living. There's just living, happening, you know. And, and the defining it as myself is, you know, it, 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 it has some usefulness. But ultimately it's just a, it's just a game uh, that we play, if that makes any sense. That's my long answer to that short question. You turned it away from me so I couldn't see, and then you turned it back towards me. I'm deliberately misinterpreting the gesture. There was no meaning to that. I know. (laughs) But see, I made it into like you were trying to hide the time from me. Okay. <laughs> but now I've ruined it. Now we've talked. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it should be Zazen at 3 o'clock. This is a good place to break. And then I hope I can do the last of the Doksan um, and then join everybody for the final Zazen. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then there will be a 